Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, so this talk is how unique is your onion, an analysis of website fingerprintability, of the fingerprintability of Tor Hidden Services. So this talk is about uh, website fingerprinting attacks, specifically on Tor Hidden Services. So let's start with talking about what Tor is. So Tor is the largest anonymity network of its kind. Um, and what Tor does is it allows our user over on the left here to visit any site that she wants to on the web without the site or anyone in the middle being able to determine where she's or which site she's visiting or where she's communicating with. So she's sitting here looking at the web page and uh, her web client is going to send uh, packets back and forth across the network there. You can see the both incoming and outcoming packets that go between her and the Tor network. And at each layer of this, uh, there's another layer of encryption, including her initial connection to the Tor network. And on Tor, uh, unlike just HTTPS, not only are these packets encrypted, but on Tor they're also padded to be uh, the same size where the cells are. So there are lots of attacks that you can do on this type of network, but we're going to focus on one very specific attack where our uh, adversary has access to this wire. Um, that is the connection between our user and the Tor network. Um, this uh, type of attack is known as website fingerprinting. <coughs> We're interested in this attack because it can be deployed by a low resource adversary. And this is the exact type of adversary that Tor is trying most to protect against. That is one uh, adversary that can see kind of one point at this network. So let's go into how this attack works if our adversary can see this super specific point on the network. So sometime when our user isn't around, he goes and uh, uses her network to access a bunch of web pages that he suspects that she's going to visit. So here he's visiting, for example, Facebook or Reddit. Um, and he mimics these uh, visits in the same way that she would visit them. And he collects uh, all of the traffic traces, the incoming and outgoing packets, how big they are, all of the timing of them. Um, and he collects them into a database. And for each of these visits, for each of these websites rather, he uh, creates kind of a fingerprint of what a general visit to this site looks like. And he uses features like the number of packets, the average packet size, uh, the percentage of packets that are incoming versus those that are outco outgoing, uh, the timing of the packets, et cetera. And he builds this database with these feature vectors based on these uh, types of features that um, you can see from just this line. <clears throat> so that sometime later, when our user comes back and goes to visit a website, our attacker can watch that line, see what the packets incoming and outgoing look like, and he can determine which of the websites from his database our attacker, our, our uh, user here is visiting. So he can see that she visited uh, the Mayo Clinic website, for example. And interestingly, she can, so now we know that our attacker can see which website someone is visiting, even if these packets are encrypted. So this attack has been studied uh, on the web in general, um, both on Tor and just on a normal network. But we're going to focus specifically on Tor hidden services or Tor onion services. So hidden services are services that by design can only be accessed through the Tor network. Uh, many of these services choose to be hidden from the normal web because they host sensitive content. So for example, this may be uh, something like SecureDrop, which hosts um, a, uh, um, an uploading site for people to uh, do whistle upload like whistleblowing files, for example, or WikiLeaks is a great example of one. So this makes them a natural target for website fingerprinting. I'll talk specifically about SecureDrop for a second. This is one of the kind of more important uh, sites in our data set, and it's a whistleblower submission system, and it allows journalists and media publishers to protect the identities of their sources so that their sources can upload documents to them without them knowing um, where the... Uh, where the source is. And in addition, uh, the second layer of protection that Onion services get that you don't get from just a normal uh, visiting over Tor is that so on Tor, the user um, is usually uh, remains anonymous. So the, uh, you can't tell where, which sites the user is visiting, and then the sites can't tell who the user is. But in addition, the second layer when Onion services is that also the user can't tell the location of the host that they're visiting as well. So, 
the size of the onion service or hidden service world is a lot smaller, orders of magnitude smaller than the web in general. And unfortunately, or fortunately for us, uh, this means that we're in a closed world. That is, we don't have to consider uh, that a user is going to one of the sites we collected or another site. We can just say, well, we can enumerate all of the hidden services that exist that we can visit. And uh, we can distinctly say our user is going to one of the sites in our data set because we know that they're going um, to an, an Onion service site. So for this purpose, uh, we collected 70 visits to 482 different Onion service sites. We collected about 1,300 in the beginning and then pared down um, duplicates, uh, failed visits, sites that are down for long periods of time, um, in addition to a lot of phishing sites that are uh, considered <coughs> that are uh, mimicking other Onion services. So you might be asking, well, th this is the Tor network, so how do you know whether or not our user is going to a hidden service or that our user is going to a uh, other website that is not a hidden service? Um, and fortunately, someone's already done this for us. So we can reliably distinguish whether someone is going, whether a visit from the web traffic is going to an onion service or if it's going to a different website. So we can uh, build this nice closed world model that we can enumerate all the sites for. So there have been a series of successful attacks in different labs on website fingerprinting generally. I'm going to go over uh, three state-of-the-art attacks that we're going to use for our analysis. The first is KNN. So they use uh, a feature vector of about 3,000 features. And these features are things like the total size, the total uh, duration of the uh, website, the number of packets, the packet ordering. They also look at these uh, traffic burst features, which are kind of how many packets get sent uh, at a time. And this is very much a take all the features possible about this trace and throw them at the KNN classifier. And then they use KNN for classification. The next one we'll look at is Kumul. This is a little more recent work. And this is a much smaller feature space. So here there's only 104 features. There are four features that are super specific to size. So this is the total number of incoming packets, the total number of outgoing packets, and the total size of the uh, sites overall. And then the other features are uh, an interpolation of the points to the cumulative sum of the both incoming and outgoing packet lengths. And they use uh, RBF SVM to do the classification. And the final one that we're going to look at, also more recent, is uh, the K-fingerprinting attack. So here, they use features that aren't dissimilar from the KNN attack, but um, are maybe a little more curated. There aren't as many of them, only 175. And here, they're using, again, timing and size features. And then the neat part of the KNN attack is actually the classification step. So they train a bunch of random forest trees on these 175 uh, features, this feature vector of 175 features. And then they use the leaves of the tree itself as a fingerprint for that website. So we ran our, uh, all three of these attacks on our data set of hidden services. And we found that Kumul performed the best on hidden services with a full 80% accuracy. So 80% of the visits were identified correctly, and about 20% weren't. And then KFP follows with 77, and then KNN with uh, about 70%. And so because we're really interested in how hidden services uh, do generally in this form, um, we want to know not only how certain attacks work in website fingerprinting over uh, on hidden services, but kind of how generally these attacks work on hidden services. So to this end, um, we combined these attacks into a sim uh, single ensemble attack. And because of the differences with features and the fact that there's a different classification technique for each, and these are very all distinct, as you saw from when I talked about them, we do kind of an ad hoc ensemble. That is, we, uh, we run each of the attacks individually, and then we combine the results to get uh, an ensemble classifier for this. We looked at a couple different ways to uh, do this uh, ensemble. The first was just straight voting. So just whoever says, uh, which, we have three classifiers here, majority rules. Um, the next was just to look at the most confident uh, answer. So here, KNN is more confident than KFP and Kumul. Um, we did some stuff with weighting. And then finally, the one that we got the best results on was this P1, P2 diff, which is 
where you take the most com the uh, top two answers for each of the classifiers, and you take the difference between them, um, and whichever one is the highest, you select that one. So in this case, we would choose KFP, because even though it's less confident than the KNN classification, the KNN thinks that it might be A as well, with only 0.4, so we'd pick KFP, KFP here, which is more, way more confident about its first choice than it is its second choice. And for our ensemble results, we got an 81% accuracy, which is a little better than the Kumul, but not really in any significant way. But again, we're not really interested in beating any of these methods because we're using them. We're interested in how they generally work on hidden service sites. And so we have come up with this nice ensemble to bring them all together um, and kind of weigh the different ways that they all work. Uh, this is where most website fingerprinting papers stop. They come up with um, some method that outperforms everything before, and it's a nice attack paper. But we're really interested in something else. What we're interested in is these misclassifications. That is, what sites can't we classify correctly? Which ones are hidden from this type of attack? And can we learn anything about them? So to do this, we uh, define fingerprintability, that is uh, a measure of how easily or how often a website is identified. And to do this, we take the F1 score from the ensemble classifier. It's not super intuitive into why we use the F1 score from our ensemble classifier, so I'm going to go into, uh, into it a little more. So this is the definition of F1 score. It's the harmonic mean of the recall and precision. And uh, so let's say you're a site like SecureDrop. And in our data set, maybe we have five secure drop instances that we're trying to identify. And so we run our ensemble classifier, and we're able to identify four of the visits as secure drop, and the last one is something else, maybe DuckDuckGo. So our true positive rate, or the recall here, would be 80%. And you would be like, well, secure drop doesn't seem that secure at all. 80% of the time, these visits are uh, identified correctly. So this is a measure of how well am I identified as me? How well are visits to my site identified as my site? But this isn't taking into account the whole picture. Because in reality, we have a huge data set of lots of sites. And let's say that four visits, all of the DuckDuckGo visits, and maybe one of the WikiLeaks visits, is also identified as secure drop. We can uh, measure this idea with uh, precision. So this is how likely is it that a positive classification in general was classified as me. So if you're a hidden service site, sure, it's important that uh, whether or not your sites are classified as you, but it's also important that other sites are not misclassified as you because you can kind of be hidden and uh, lessen the confidence of any classification that's you. So if all DuckDuckGo instances are classified as secure drop, secure drop is pretty secure because an attacker will never know if given a positive uh, secure drop reference if uh, it's actually DuckDuckGo or if it's secure drop. So there's a lot less confidence in the answer. So we use precision for this, and then we get half there, 0.5. And then for the F1 score, it's the harmonic mean of these uh, two metrics, the precision and recall, and we get a nice balance between the two. Here, 0.65. Uh, spoiler alert, this is not the F1 score for secure drop, but we'll get into that later. So now let's get into some of the nice pictures for this. Uh, this is a confusion graph for the sites misclassified by Kumul. So for example, uh, each of these nodes is a site, and each of the edges is a misclassification. So if we have two nodes in the graph, let's say they're secure drop and DuckDuckGo, and there's an edge between them, that means that DuckDuckGo was mistaken for secure drop. It was misclassified as secure drop. And we can learn a couple interesting things from this type of uh, analysis. The first thing that we see here are these ellipses. So some of these ended up being um, false positives for uh, the uh, duplicate reduction that we did. But um, a lot of these are also single sites that were constantly or consistently misclassified as another site. So here we have, um, like in my example from earlier, all the DuckDuckGo instances being identified as secure drop, for example. And if all the secure drop ones were identified as DuckDuckGo, you would end up with these uh, strong ellipses in here. And the other type of uh, sites that we see that seem to be safe from this attack are these uh, large clusters. 
So these are sites uh, or clusters of sites that are con constantly and consistently misclassified by uh, as other sites in the same cluster. So for example, the dark green cluster in the bottom left corner, it looks kind of black here, but uh, is a bunch of uh, sites that are very similar in size and are very large and are, have a similar uh, size. So now that we've seen a little bit of the places or the sites that Kumul fails on, let's see how these methods fail together. So this is a, a Venn diagram of all of the misclassifications from all three of the, of the classifiers. Um, so these are visits that are safe from an attack. So for example, on the left there, we have visits that are only misclassified by KNN. And in the middle, we have visits that are misclassified by all three. And what we learn here is that we have some sites, 30%, that are hidden from all of the attacks. So 30% of the sites, or the visits rather, um, are not found by any of the, uh, any of the methods. Now we want to, so we see that there are some sites that are safe, but the next question is, we see that they fail in this way, or that these classifiers fail in this way, but when they make a mistake, do they make a mistake in the same way, or do they make a mistake in a different way? So that is, uh, for example, if KNN misclassifies uh, DuckDuckGo as secure drop, does Kumul mistake DuckDuckGo also as secure drop, or does it misidentify DuckDuckGo as something else, so WikiLeaks, for example? So here we have the percentage of sites that are misclassified as the same site. So if you want to think back to that nice uh, confusion graph, uh, you can think of each of these uh, circles as edges in the graph. So for example, in that KNN circle, we have edges that are only, only in the KNN confusion graph, and then we had edges in, only in the, in the Kumul uh, graph, and in the middle there, we have edges that are in all three graphs, so misclassifications that are exactly the same. And so we see not only that uh, these sites, there are a lot of sites that are hidden from um, all three of the classifiers, but when we see when, that when these attacks fail and they do misclassifications, that they fail in very different ways. So now I'm going to get a little bit into the feature analysis here. We find that there are two important predictors for a website fingerprinting attack or whether a site will be misclassified or not. We find that size is a super important feature, and that a lot of these uh, features that these classifiers use are really act kind of as a proxy for size. And then uh, we also find that uh, in order for a site to remain uh, hidden from this type of attack, it also needs to be very dynamic, as well as uh, small. And so for the duration of this talk, I'm going to focus on size, as far as timing goes. Um, and if you want to learn more about the static features, you can look more into the paper. So let's first look at the median of the total incoming packet size for our misclassified instances. So on the x-axis here, we have uh, the size of the site that is misclassified. And on the y-axis, we have the size of the site that our classifier thinks that uh, our site, our visit is. And so what we see here is that we have this nice uh, red line up the middle. So for each misclassification, um, you're generally going to be misclassified as a site that is similar in size to you. So sites are misclassified, are misclassified as sites of the same size. So up to this point though, we've only looked at misclassifications and sites that are misclassified. Um, but some sites are more misclassified than others and some are, hidden, or some are not hidden from this attack at all. So here we'll go back to this uh, fingerprintability score. Here we have the fingerprintability score, which again is this uh, F1 measure for our ensemble classifier. And it measures really nicely how well or how easily a website is fingerprinted by these attacks generally. And then on the x-axis there, we have the incoming packet size over the duration of the, uh, of the trace for a website. And so the first thing that we can see is that no large sites are hidden from these attacks. So if you're a large site, a large hidden service site, you're going to be susceptible to this type of attack. The second thing we learn here is that many of the small sites are hidden. And finally, some aren't though. But we don't make traces when we make hidden service sites or sites in general on the web. We make websites, we make web pages, we make HTML. 
So while our attacker has access to these trace features, like the number of packets and the average packet size and the percentage of packets that are incoming and outgoing, all these things you can just learn from the trace, our web developer over there, or our head of service developer in this case, has access to things like how many resources her site uses, how many fonts her site uses, how big her site is going to be generally, how many scripts that it uses, um, et cetera. And we can actually kind of use screenshot here, interestingly, as uh, the size of the screenshot is kind of the number of resources because it's the size of the images. And so we want to know, can we be able to tell our web developer how to design a hidden service site that would be less susceptible to this type of attack? And how do we learn this? So can we determine what characteristics of a website itself are going to affect its fingerprint ability score? So we're going to throw machine learning at it. Here we create a, a meta learner. And so we have our database of websites that we've determined the fingerprint ability score of. And we also have a lot of information about the websites themselves, the things that our web developer would have access to. And so this is what our database looks like. We have a site that has a fingerprint ability score. Um, and then we have a bunch of features about the site, and then the site itself. And so we train a random forest classifier on uh, these websites, trying to label them by fingerprint ability. Note here that our goal isn't really to create a great classifier that's going to be able to determine fingerprint ability, but our goal more is to figure out how our classifier makes decisions, how the random forest uh, classifier makes these types of decisions, and what we can learn from uh, the correlations between the fingerprint ability score and these high-level web developer features. So um, from this classifier, <clears throat> we pull out the info gain for the random forest, and uh, these are the uh, results that we get. So for our larger sites, we find that things like the uh, screenshot size, the total download size, the HTML source size are uh, really important. And for our smaller sites, um, we see that things like the standard deviation of the screenshot size start to become much more important. And I said I wasn't going to talk about dynamism that much, but um, this is showing us that when you're small, you may be well hidden, but that uh, if you want to hide yourself farther, uh, you need to be a little more variable between visits. So in this case, this is the uh, change between how big your site will be on each visit to the site. And I'll go back to SecureDrop really quick, because I did a call forward before. Uh, the SecureDrop site in our data set had an F1 score of 99%. Um, this means it is almost exclusively always identified by uh, our ensemble classifier, and therefore by the other classifiers around it. So um, it is not safe against this type of attack, um, as well as most of the hidden services that we looked at. And multiple or duplicates of these secure drop sites do exist across um, the web, but this doesn't offer a whole lot of protection. So uh, to conclude, um, website fingerprinting attacks are successful on Tor hidden services, as they are the web in general. Um, and we asked, are certain websites more susceptible to website fingerprinting attacks than others? Definitely. And uh, we also explored why certain sites are more, are more identifiable to these types of attacks than others and found that uh, some combination of the size of the site as well as how dynamic it is between visits seems to be the answer here. So if you're a hidden service and you want to be hidden, be small, change a lot. Our code and our uh, data sets are up here as well as a lot more info um, on some of the results in the paper, so feel free to visit that to learn more. And I'll take any questions. Thanks. So for SecureDrop, even if it was a small, hard-to-fingerprint site, you would also have this weird behavior where people are uploading stuff. Is that going to make it just really impossible to cover for it? Um, so the size of what you're uploading is going to be less consistent, right? So when we're doing website fingerprinting work in general, people are only ever really looking at uh, the kind of the front page, the home page of the site that you're going to. Um, and so I'd assume that if you're uploading um, different files that it's really hard to come up with training data on that, right? So like you can say, um, 
you're going to see like a, a large burst in packets uh, at the time of the upload, but the attacker would have to know kind of what packets were going to be uploaded in, or what, what data would have to be uploaded for that. I guess I just mean the fact that there is uploading going on is like unusual, right? Um, it may be, but it's not like there aren't other hidden service sites where people are updating loads of data to at the same time. So it would really depend on uh, it being able to be hidden amongst other sites that people are uploading large files to, which I assume there should be many. So it's a very good work. Um, I noticed that um, if the website changes their characteristics, that means if a website is updated, then how do you want to model that behavior in your prediction technique? or finger, finger probability, what do you call it? Thing. So let me repeat your question so I make sure that I understood uh, it. So I'm saying, let's say the website has been changing over time. Yeah. If a website has been changed over time, so how do you want to model that behavior in your, in your prediction model? How, how do you want to capture that in your prediction model? Yeah, so I mean, if a website just like does a full redesign, you're not going to be able to catch that, right? Mm -hmm. But this type of attack is uh, kind of supposed to be done over a shorter amount of time, where you're interested in kind of what sites are one per is one person visiting, um, and so you collect the data mm -hmm. kind of recently, and then and then you do that. But yeah, if there's a full redesign of a site, uh, no, I'm not. But let's say the content has been changed over time, so the, and then uh, the so you are capturing the feature as a size. So size may be changed over time, right? So in that case, you have to update your model. Yeah, well, exactly. So, I mean, this is not an attack paper, right? right. Um, we're not saying, like, we made this cool attack, and right. it's super robust against these types of things. That's a lot of other work. Um, we've shown that, yeah, if you do want to actually, if you're a hidden service and you want to hide, that one of the ways to hide is just change constantly, right? Hmm. The sites that were hidden in our, in, our, uh, by our, in, our, in our model here were the ones that changed all the time, and that's very much the point, right? And this doesn't mean that you have to change, like do a site redesign all the time. These don't have to be changes like that, but being able to be a little bit dynamic between visits, use different resources, number of resources, this type of thing will make you less susceptible to a website fingerprinting attack generally. And the second question I have, your feature part. Yeah. So you use the typical feature set, like uh, the size and the timing information and so on. But there is a possibility that you can use some engram type of features because it's encrypted traffic. So you can capture the how many packets are sending for over for, from one site to the another site. So there's some work in there that was published in la, last year in ASSEC. So you can take a look. Uh, yeah. th that has a robust feature set they use. Again, we're really interested in uh, like these super high-level features that mm -hmm. our web developer has access to, um, and we're just using the low-level features that other attacks have used in the past. It would be great to ex be able to extend this work to other recent attacks that have worked and look at their feature sets as well. But again, yeah. we're really interested in these super high-level things and relying on prior work sure. done for okay. the low-level features. Thank you. Oh, very nice talk, thanks. And uh, my question is about countermeasures, even though this is not an attack. Is there a way to kind of mitigate this fingerprintability without overloading the Tor network and also that does not rely on padding or random padding? Yeah, actually, I think that that's exactly what we're trying to say in this paper, right? Is that all of these attacks so far have been, go ahead, have been um, about uh, padding and making your site bigger and randomly bigger in certain ways. Um, but what we've shown is that like our the biggest sites in our data set are the ones that are most identifiable. So uh, there may be ways to mitigate website fingerprinting attacks, at least on a per hidden service basis, that aren't uh, just make yourself pad randomly, right? So And that would be a lot less uh, stress on the Tor network. Okay, 